Cool, then I guess let's get started. So yeah, welcome. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Daniel and uh, I'm gonna walk you through the eighth uh, uh, iteration of the CMFI mass spec seminar today. And yeah, it's gonna be my pleasure to, to pick up uh, where Robin left uh, as last time was like the files he processed with MZMind3 and the feature finding step. And now we're going to generate um, a feature based uh, molecular network out of like that very same files. And you may have like been here last week. So you may even like walk through with Robin and, and process these work same files. So if you have them, you can of course like uh, use them. They need to be on the GMPS server. So if you have not done that, um, you would need to upload them uh, to your user space. If you did not do that, it's, it's not a problem. I prepared a test data set with like that same files and I uploaded them into a massive um, data set from which we can grab them in a, in a second. And yeah, in case you are here the first time, just like a short um, here info for the, um, for the class. Let me see. Um, yeah, so this is the, uh, yeah, Zoom of I mass spec seminar series and yeah we meet every two weeks here on uh tuesdays so yeah feel free to sign up if you have not done that here's the link um on this page on the bottom and yeah so the as i said the um, content of the class today is we want to generate a feature-based molecular network and at the same time we're going to also include the ion identity um, molecular network in there so this was uh something robin did like last time at the very end um, so there is some like new information, but you will see that this is kind of just like an advanced feature-based molecular network. Um, and then, yeah, like, so we're going to generate this now at first in, in GNPS. And I would say, let's jump um, right into this. So if you can open your browsers and, and go to gmps.ucsd.edu, um, uh, you can like, uh, yeah, basically visit like this page here. And if you have an account already, you can like sign in on the top right. If you have not an account yet, um, you can sign up. It's just going to take you um, a couple of seconds. So wh while I speak, um, yeah, you, you can jump on that. Maybe just to get an idea who, who already has an account and um, who is uh, already signed in. Can you give me like a, a thumbs up so, so I can move on? Okay, I see one thumb up. Two, uh, okay. All right, so let me ask the other way around, who, who still needs to, um, to sign, to make an account and log in? nobody all right if not um and you get lost at any time like i'll put the recording up later so um then hopefully you can just like go back in the in the video so yeah once you you sign basically up then yeah you just need to uh scroll down here on the page and then you should see uh here like different options for data analysis and what we want for like the feature-based molecular network is here, this um, uh, feature networking. And you basically just need to um, click here on like this analyze button. And if you do so, then like the feature-based molecular networking workflow should pop up. So this is a proteo safe workflow. It looks very much like the um, classic molecular networking workflow, what we did uh, a couple of sessions ago was together with Peter Dorstein. Um, but yeah, here it's a little bit of reduced um, number of, of fields we can fill in. So technically from here on, it's, it's almost like simpler. Um, yeah, like you can give this thing like a title now. So I don't know, like CMFI uh, test data, feature-based molecular networking also. And then the most important step is that you select here then the files. So yeah, after you selected a title, you click here on select input files um, on one of these bottom fields. And then like the same time as for the um, classic molecular network um, a couple of weeks ago, a new window should pop up and you should see basically here like this different options with like the file three on like the left and then the different selection options on the right. And yeah, like uh, here my um, test account 
should probably look pretty much like yours but in, in case you have not uploaded much data yet so yeah here you will like basically only see like very very few data set in case you have uploaded the test data already then this would like basically appear as a folder under your username's uh, root folder so for me that would be here fm lab um but yeah like i didn't upload anything because i just kind of pull it now from a public massive data set and in case you have not uploaded data then i would recommend you um to do the same thing so yeah basically what you need to do is um to get to like the data share folder you will need to like uh, click to this uh, share files tab on the very top. So there's like this three fields and, and you put here, um, uh, you click on share files and then under import data share, you will type in this massive number, which is here MSV 00008923. And once you type this number in, you simply hit the import button on the right to it. And then this public data set should appear in your user space. And then you can select files from there. So in order to do that, you would need to click um, on the top here back to select input files. And then you should uh, jump back to that ori uh, original view and now see that there is a new folder appearing with this massive uh, MSV um, accession number here. It's called CMFI MS Seminar 2022 um, FBMN uh, test data. And now there is a different subfolders from which we're gonna pull now um, like the files we need in order to generate the feature-based molecular network. And yeah, like the most important one is the uh, MGF file. So the .mgf file, this is here called iimn.mgf and this is basically a text file that contains all the msms spectra we exported from mzmine uh, with robin uh, two weeks ago so then you basically click on this um, and then it should be like blue highlighted and then you click for each of those uh, files on like here, this box um, in, the, in the middle, right? And then it should basically select it. So you first can do this for like here, the green highlighted MGF file. So this goes into the MS2 file, green box here on the top. Then you're gonna um, uh, use the quant file. So this is basically the feature table from MZMind. This would be like the blue one. And then the other two files are optional. So this would be like your metadata. And then interestingly, because we not wanna create only a feature-based molecular network, but an ion identity molecular network. Um, the last file would then here, this additional edges from external tool file. And this here is called IIMN edges underscore MS annotation.csv. And this is a really important information for you all because in case you wanna become like an expert using these tools and now come up with a new metric to like connect features in your whatever feature finding, um, tool or downstream, I don't know, other types of prioritization, you can generate such ed edge files simply um, in a text editor or like in, in Excel and then save them as CSV. They just need to have the same formatting as this example file here. And then you can like add additional connectivity in, in your molecular network. And yeah, for us like, playing around with like new tools all the time, this, this is really a nice option um, that Ming enabled this, um, yeah, like to, to import now edges from external tools. Okay, so now, yeah, when you like clicked on all of these boxes, um, accordingly um, after you clicked on the um, files, so you have to do this one by one. So I would suggest start with the MGF, um, click this here in the green box so that it's highlighted and then up here, then they should start to appear under the um, select file, selected files list here. And yeah, it looks basically then um, like this. And oh yeah, I forgot one other file type um, you may want to add. So this is also optional. It's, it's, not, um, it's not like um, needed, but you can also select the raw um, MZML files now. So this would be here um, indicated through like this black arrow under the peak button, uh, peak folder. So you can just select this peak folder and then put this under original MZML files. And this is 
not really needed for like the feature-based molecular network, but in case you want to use the dashboard um, later on, that allows you to also inspect raw files directly in the web browser with GMPS, uh, which I think is, is really um, handy. Maybe in, in two sessions from now, so Ming is going to highlight this more in, in detail. I just wanted already to mention that this is like possible. Anyway, once you selected all that files, it should look like this here, right? So like under these different like sections, there are like the different files basically selected. And in case you selected a wrong file here somewhere, this is not uh, the end of the world, just click on it so it's blue highlighted and then uh, click on this like um, uh, white X uh, button on the left to it and that it should like disappear again. And then you can like, I don't know, select the right file and, and, and move it um, into its right place. All right, I think this was a lot of talking for um, a couple of files to be selected. So who of you managed to get uh, to the point where, where I am right now? Can I get some thumbs up? Um, best if you use like the thumbs up uh, buttons. So I see it here in the um, participant list. Uh oh, oh, Laura has a problem. Miguel got it. Uh, Diana got it. Great. What about the others? Okay, Laura, do you do you want to tell us where uh, where you got stuck so we can maybe maybe somebody else run into the same problem? Um. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Are you uh, are you listening? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, nice. So, um, yeah, I I'm sorry for interrupting, but uh, I tried to upload the data that I processed through MZ Mind 3. And mm -hmm. when I looked at the CSV uh, document, it was empty. I don't oh. have a, a, a list of masses yet. yet. So, so um, I got stuck in that, uh, in that point. And, I haven't been able to upload my 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 data because yeah I have no idea what was wrong in the process. Okay, yeah, okay. This I think is probably a little bit a bigger problem to troubleshoot right now here. Mm -hmm. um, what yeah. we can do is later after we're done with like the um, the hands-on tutorial, we we can like maybe revisit that in the uh, um, question and answer um, uh, section of the today's seminar. Because I assume it's it's a problem on MZ on the MZ mine side, right? So if, uh -huh. you, if your file is not ready, so for now maybe you can just use the shared files yeah. I generated yeah, 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 for, sure. for this um, uh, test purpose, right? And then move on from from there. Uh huh. Yep. Yep. I'm gonna do that. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. All right. Anybody else who got stuck and we should wait for, or can we move on? All right. I don't hear any. Objections? Yeah, so if you want me to like repeat something, just let me know. I'm, I'm happy to, to make sure everybody can, can follow. All right, if it's not the case, I'm also glad to move on. Um, all right, so once you like selected all these files or folders and, and they're kind of like in, in, in the right place, then all you need to do is here um, hit this finish selection button, right? And then like all the files should be considered then yeah, you would then uh, close it closes this window and you come back to the um, original uh, Proteo safe workflow. So now we're almost done. So like now the only thing which I would suggest uh, to do is to like, like make the mass tolerance a little bit smaller. Um, here we typically um, see, uh, yeah, use like 0 0.01 Dalton and I think by default it's 0 0.02. If you have a higher accuracy, you could even like um, decrease this farther. But for like yeah, like our Obitrap data, we found this to be like a um, a good value. And yeah, also you want to make sure that like the um, quantification table source is set to MZMine because this is the tool we processed um, it, the data with before. But by default, this should be um, already selected. So then, yeah, like unless you want to like um, uh, use some of the advanced filtering options also here, which maybe later on as, as you refine your analysis, you may want to make use of, um, you're already set, right? So like you don't have to do this optional options here, um, but you can go straight um, down to the to the bottom of the of the workflow now. 
uh, just type in your email address in case this is not already um, selected. And then all that is left to do is hit the submit button on the, top, on the bottom right. And then, yeah, what should appear is basically um, like a, a few like that, that says it's running. Um, and then, yeah, like you can like look at what stage of the, of the process um, it is. Uh, I find this rather confusing. So I, I just wait till I get an email that, that tells me that it's done typically. All right, um, any questions till here? for now. Okay, Lara, uh, yeah, for QTOF, you can use 0 0.02, that, that's fine. I mean, depends on the on the QTOF uh, you have and how accurate um, like uh, the mass um, is. Um, but yes, I think as a default, this is fine too. All right, so then, yeah, I think that was already like the most important hands-on part on how to generate a feature-based molecular network. Um, who of you made it to that point and has like this uh, running workflow now in front of them? Can I get some thumbs up in case it worked or thumbs down in case it didn't? Okay, no response. Okay, cool, two. All right, awesome. What, what about the others? A lot of um, silent people among us for, for me it's early in the morning so that'd be okay but you guys are mainly located in europe i guess so um yeah please let me know in case you have any questions or you get hung up somewhere so i'm, I'm happy to to revisit it um let's assume the rest of you also got it running um then yeah now we want to like talk a little bit about what we actually just did Right, so because now, okay, we have this job running, but under the hood, there's a lot of like different stuff going on now. So yeah, what, what is feature-based um, molecular networking? And yeah, I hope that, that most of you um, were able to, to come to like the previous seminars already or watch the videos on our um, YouTube channel uh, when we talked about um, mass spectrometry and in particular um, LCMS and LCMSMS. So yeah, like the data we just um, like processed here is basically non-targeted LCMS-MS data from uh, an Orbitrap, in particular a QXactive uh, mass spec. And yeah, what, what we did is we separated molecules over an HPLC column, ionized them, and then in data-dependent acquisition mode, um, acquire a lot of like MS2 spectra as well as MS1 spectra during like the survey scans, right? So then yeah, Tomas and, and Robin talked a little bit about like the um, feature finding and how we can um, make use um, of feature finding tools. And the session before with Peter, we talked about molecular networking, right? And just as a reminder, so what, what molecular networking does is it basically takes like all like this MSMS spectra that were generated um, in this data dependent acquisition mode and then organizes them based on their spectral similarity using like a, a cosine um, metric. So it basically connects similar MSMS spectra if they're above a certain like cosine threshold and then connects them as dots in a molecular network. Right? So now um, having this networks, it's really nice because we can propagate annotation there. So in case like one molecule matched um, against the library, then yeah, we can propagate this annotation and say, okay, the surrounding nodes might be like analogs or, you know, like something very, very similar. Okay, so then yeah, in addition to that, what we did uh, last time uh, with Robin was, uh, besides the MSMS information, we also dealt with the MS1 information, right? So like we built chromatograms, we deconvoluted them, and yeah, basically like just different spec uh, steps here um, that are like maybe puzzling you a little bit but when you spend time and, and like go through like uh, every each of one of them, um, then it, it may make sense. And in particular, if you revisit the video with Robin where he explained, I think most of those steps very nicely. Um, so yeah, now this was so all done in kind of like a batch mode. So while MZ Mine was like executing that a lot, like a lot of different tasks, this can be like just like um, organized in a batch and then basically run through like um, automatically. And then at the end, what you ended up with are basically like the files that we just processed. But 
yeah, thinking a little bit about those files, I think it's, it's very important to, to, again, think about like the um, uh, data structure we have. So we have this MS1 information, right, in, in each file. So these are the survey scans between the MS-MS events, and you get like this full MS spectra. And then what MZMine does, it basically picks like this masses, right, according to your thresholds and so on. So like this different mass peaks here, and then connects them to chromatograms. So this is what we call an extracted ion chromatogram, XIC, or um, I don't know, has some different words others use anyway. So now we have here uh, chromatograms or features, and then we connect them to um, MS-MS events for this particular masses that were triggered during the time window of this um, chromatogram, right? So now we have a connection of MS-1 feature and MS-MS scan. And at the end, we also compared these features between like all the samples that were included in our data set, and then have here such like an aligned uh, feature list. And this is already what's basically in your feature table. So like the CSV file, the quant file, which you selected basically contains of a matrix that has different masses and retention times, and then a peak area for each of the samples you have. And yeah, like if you want, you can like play around with it and, and open this file in, in your uh, text editor. Um, and you will see, yeah, there's basically just like a two-dimensional uh, matrix. And then in addition, all the uh, MSMS scans that are linked, right? So here indicated through like this uh, yellow stars, they are um, listed in that MGF file you selected. Okay, and these are like the two um, uh, essential parts for feature-based molecular networking. And then yeah, in addition, we had like this ion identity um, uh, molecular networking file where we also have a connectivity of co-alluding features. And this was one of the steps Robin did at the end, where he basically uh, looked at all features that have the same chromatographic shape, like here um, in this example. Um, and then when they, uh, the data points are correlated to each other, had like a certain uh, Pearson correlation above a certain threshold, right? And then, um, yeah, basically what this does is that it enables you to figure out which ion species in your LCMS data may belong to the same molecule because they have exactly the same retention time. And then we can do the ion identity, um, a networking step in which we now define certain like um, adducts that we expect, you know, and then we can like annotate here, for example, like this ammonia adduct or the sodium adduct or here a water loss and in-source fragment um, and basically get um, an idea of what identities those different ions have. We can then also further expand this list, um, you know, and, and kind of create a network of different um, adducts or in-source fragments within this data. And I think this is for me quite, quite powerful because this bypasses also a little bit like the problem that sometimes uh, some of these adducts do not have um, similar MS, MS fragmentation, especially when you go, for example, between like the progenated uh, species to like the sodium adducts or so, then sometimes this differs uh, quite significantly. Okay, and this was, in, this information was then in that ion identity um, edge file. And yeah, metadata contains just like the, um, the sample information and then this um, original uh, peaks files, basically that was just like the original um, uh, centroid uh, data, which we don't really need right now, but later on for like the um, dashboard uh, session, you you may gonna make uh, use of it. Anyway, so now, yeah, like for like the molecular networking parts, there's like these two, uh, I think, important papers. One is from 2016 from Ming Wang, and others, it's the original uh, GMPS paper, basically like introducing GMPS and molecular networking. And then there's also um, a detailed uh, protocols paper um, from two years ago from Allegra Aran and others uh, that describes classic molecular networking very much in detail. So if you're like still learning about it, I would recommend you to take a look at those papers, um, these two for classic molecular networking. And now a very important question for this, for this session today is why do we do uh, feature-based molecular networking instead of classical molecular networking sometimes? And I think the very uh, straightforward answer would be one's uh, sensitivity, and then the second one would be isomers. And now, yeah, I just have here like this made up example where um, we basically like look at two samples, um, A and B, and uh, both of them contain 
uh, three features, right, indicated through just like uh, three peaks. And now in a classical molecular network, again, we only look at the MS-MS data, right? So like we only cluster like the um, MS-MS spectra and then organize them in a network. And yeah, if we uh, have um, an MS-MS triggered for a compound, great, you know, but um, we can then uh, display this um, here in, in such a network. And like compare like the intensity of the precursor of the MSMS -MS scan or the spectral counts or whatever, um, and then yeah use this as a quantitative information. But now often we unfortunately have the case that especially in complex samples the duty cycle time was like not long and uh, not short enough to reach all compounds that colluded, or simply like the compound was not abundant enough to trigger your MS2 threshold, right? So this would be here the case in sample B, where like this last green peak actually was not in, uh, like abundant enough to, to make the cut of the MSMS threshold. So no MSMS event was triggered. So now if we uh, would look um, at this um, molecular network, we would uh, basically assume that uh, when we combine like the two samples, right, and, and look at these pie charts here, that here the uh, MZ700 was not uh, present at all in, in sample B, right? But now if we would look at MS1, we would actually see, oh, there's actually like a very nice peak, right? And this is exactly what we observe with feature-based molecular networking or feature finding in general, that we are like way more sensitive and we detect way more features than if we would only do this based on, on um, MS2. So yeah, here I think especially for like statistical questions, when you want to like compare sample treatment groups or so, I think feature-based molecular networking, if um, everything set properly, might be more sensitive and, and more accurate um, for, your, for your question. All right, and then uh, exactly. So now if we compare this here with a, a more quantitative feature-based molecular network, because we would here for like this abundance now take the peak area into account. In the second network, we would see nicely, oh, there is actually also some um, signal in sample B, and maybe it's a little bit lower than in sample A, but it's not like, you know, absent as we would have like uh, thought of it as uh, from the data in the uh, classic molecular network. All right, so again, taken together, feature-based molecular networking, um, takes the uh, MSMS spectra, right? And then links them to like the feature intensity from this MS1 data. And I think, yeah, this basically summarizes it uh, very um, nicely that we kind of like, yeah, bridge the feature finding tools such as mz 3 but also OpenMS, XCMS, uh, MS Dial, or also some commercial tools. Um, and yeah, like add like this molecular networking um, only as a um, type of like annotation on top of it. Okay, and then, yeah, there's like two, these two papers um, we published last year and, and two years ago, one about like feature-based molecular networking and then the other about like the extension of it, ion identity molecular networking, which, yeah, if you want to le learn more about this, I would, I would recommend you to, to take a look at. All right, so then, yeah, this leaves us with, with two methods, right? And we kind of like need to decide a little bit um, when to use what. And if you're like absolute beginners and you hear about uh, molecular networking the first time today, I would strongly suggest that you get started with classic molecular networking. Because yeah, this is just like simpler to do. You don't have to deal with like all the settings for feature finding and you can like do less mistakes, right? Because like if, settings are not appropriate, maybe the results from feature finding can be quite funky. But you have to be aware of cause of like the limitations. So one would be, um, yeah, basically the um, uh, like uh, difference in, in sensitivity and accuracy, what I, what I just said. And the other one is isomers. So here, for example, when you look at one um, extracted ion chromatogram, Right, like especially here working with like natural products, and often we see that one mass can has like multiple peaks um, over yeah, like the your chromatographic separation. And in classic molecular networking, unless um, those are very different molecules with very different like fragmentation behaviors, sometimes what happens is that they're all clustered together. And here, yeah, in this um, example from from Louis, uh, I think this was very nicely shown that actually indeed 
all this different like isomers here that were super nicely separated by chromatography were clustered together into this one node. So here, yeah, like classic molecular networking eventually does not consider um, your different derivatives or um, your different like um, isomers. Um, and hence, yeah, so may only shows you like one, one uh, superficial part um, of the chemical space there. And yeah, on the other side was, was MZMI2 um, in, in that case and, and feature-based molecular networking, we could nicely deconvolute those individual peaks and then display them as individual nodes. So here, so it's clear gain that you get like isomers um, eventually resolved if they are resolved um, by your chromatography, of course. So yeah, this is the other I think, big advantage of feature-based uh, molecular networking. And then, yeah, like uh, last but not least, I uh, want to point out also that there is very detailed documentation um, on the uh, GMPS GitHub. So yeah, here you can like visit um, this link here on the top and uh, later on we'll also put all these links into like the description of the video. So um, you don't have to write this string down right now. But yeah, we, we put a lot of work into writing documentation for both feature-based molecular networking for ion identity molecular networking. So yeah, I, I would recommend you to, to make use of these resources if you still have questions. Um, all right. But I guess for now, I think this was uh, it about like the theory um, behind uh, feature-based molecular networking and what I spent the last um, couple of minutes of today's uh, um, seminar with is actually now looking at the data. And now one question uh, to those of you who submitted the job, did you already get an email that it was finished? Yes, no? Okay, no emails so far with the finished job? Okay, sometimes it takes like half an hour or so, so we might just be uh, not on time. That's why I prepared here um, this uh, example link. Right, and let me see if I can paste this in the chat. Yes, okay. So I, I just pasted it in the chat so you don't have to type it. Um, yeah, if you click on it, um, then this should be uh, just open in your web browser. And then what you would see is a page like this. All right, and yeah, for everybody who did not manage to submit a job, also that's your chance now to um, to jump back in and look at the output at least with us. Um, of course, I would encourage you to like then later on try it again and, and submit the jobs yourself just as a test case, you know, and see if it if you get it running. All right, so who has the who has like this? screen in front of them in their own web browser right now. Okay, Nika, awesome. Okay, awesome. Okay, this is already, I guess, a better success rate. Um, uh, great. So yeah, I just want to like show you like very briefly now in the next couple of minutes, what the output from like this feature-based molecular networking looks like. And yeah, like the so it might be a little bit overwhelming because there's too many options. Later, as you dive into that, you will appreciate uh, probably most of these options because they show you different statistic views. They show you different link out options, for example, to like a uh, mole net enhancer and so on. And, and I think they're quite useful, but um, yeah, for now on just, uh, I wanna show you like basically three things here, uh, which is most important to, to my daily data analysis. And this is first of all, um, look what we have identified. So here, if you click on this uh, view all library hits um, link, highlighted in this red box now here, um, then a new page should open in which you see all the molecules that were identified. And yeah, it basically looks like that. You can scroll down then and, and, and look a little bit around and see basically here um, different like compound names, right? So here we have, for example, a Yersinia Bactin dimer, and you see here a cosine score, and then a number of shared peaks, uh, mass arrow, and so on. And, and just like as a, as a very uh, general uh, like guideline, yeah, if you sort by cosine, so you have like the highest cosine 
at the top. So this is a cosine of one. That means that's that's perfectly identical, right? And the cosine of 0 0.99, this is very, very a uh, good match, right? And maybe let me actually uh, try and open this in my web browser now too. So we can do this more interactively. Um, yeah, so if I go to fewer library hits, then um, yeah, you have like now all like these options to like also look at those matches, right? So for example, here, um, like this uh, HPTZTN uh, carboxylic acid here uh, with a cosine of one. It's so good because I think I actually annotated it. So it's from perhaps like the very same data. So it should yield into a, a perfect match, of course. But yeah, you can like also inspect this here by clicking on the few mirror match button, right? And then like this mirror view here appears. And yeah, if you have a match like this, then I think this is very, a very nice um, example um, that this is a high confident match, right? And then, yeah, in this case would be a level two annotation. And if you uh, um, plot than this in, in your paper as I also, I think this, this adds like a lot of confidence that this was actually a good match. Let's take a look at some of the others here with 0 0.99 cosine, like go to like few mirror match. Yeah, again here, this is, this is a very good match. And then typically the mass error here in PPM should be well below five for our orbitrap. So here we have one PPM mass error. Yeah, for actually all of them, okay, here's zero. Sometimes it's one or two. Okay, here it's eight. So this is not that great anymore, but it's still, it's still I think, acceptable. Um, so yeah, this gives you kind of like an idea what molecules are in there. If you scroll to the very right, you can also see actually structures in case there were smiles um, provided for the library entries. All right, so this was the first thing. So I think we learned already now that, well, E. coli Nissel, so this is where our data came from, makes uh, Yersinia bactin and also Aerobactin, which um, are siderophores and, and quite interesting. But now we may want to like learn something about, you know, like the new molecules that are around some of the knowns. And, and a typical way to, to get there um, is to look at like all the features individually. So if we go to view all spectra with IDs here on the right, and I click this, then I basically get also like a table view now where all the features um, of my, um, yeah, like data set are now listed. So here, okay, um, we should see, yeah, that there is a total of 1,500 uh, features. And, you know, I can like now see here, okay, um, some of them are organized in a, in a, in a network. Um, most of them do not have a library ID here. So NA, right? And then, yeah, I can scroll down and look. Here, there's one, one thing uh, annotated. So adenosine uh, cyclophosphate. Um, it does not, is, is, does not have a network. So there's no link here for a few network. But yeah, if we would now search, for example, for Yersinia, back then, you know, then, okay, I would now see like all like the nodes that are annotated and there is this few network button. And then very nicely, when I click this, I can directly visualize the network of like this particular molecular family in the web browser, similar to like the classic molecular networking. Right? And I see, okay, what's, what, what's actually going on here? And yeah, then I'll see, oh, there's actually a ton of different like, um, adducts or like um, similar uh, molecules, so, so similar like derivatives or isomers. And yeah, all the blue ones are annotated. Right? And then I can here change the node labels to library ID. And then I see, oh, actually most of them are Yersinia bactin um, dimer, Yersinia bactin. Uh, here there's some different uh, iron adducts that were eventually annotated also through ion identity molecular networking. So this is, this is really cool. And I think it gives us a, a nice overview um, of this family. All right, so now this is uh, for the web visualization. So while this is all you know coming in very handy and very quick, so like to take like a first look at your data, it does of course not show you like the full molecular network. And it's also limited with regards to um, uh, formatting. So that's why the last thing I want to show you what we can do from uh, here on. Oh, let me see. Okay. Would be, um, yeah, to go here back to status page 
and then download the full data package of like the process data. And that uh, I typically gonna do through like the download Cytoscape data, but there's also another option if you wanna go straight to Cytoscape, there's the direct Cytoscape preview download button. For now, I, I would suggest let's just download this full folder here. So I just click on download Cytoscape data and then um, yeah, this new page should appear and then there should be um, eventually, uh, yeah, like here, this save file thing uh, opening up. And yeah, let me just see. Okay, I downloaded it already last time, but if I hadn't, um, I would just click here on, on save or in my case, speichern. Um, and then, yeah, like uh, I get a zipped file downloaded, which then eventually, let me actually see if I can just um, redo this quickly. Um, yeah, so here, if I would save this now, then yeah, see like here, a zipped file is downloaded. And then in order to make use of it, um, I would actually still need to extract it. So then I you just right click and extract to like a new folder. And then yeah, like a new folder appears here on the top. And then yeah, like all these files here are now um, organized in different uh, um, folders. So now also this is, I think, already pretty advanced because it gives you a lot of like different informations, you know, like the feature table, the metadata, the uh, library annotations, all in like some sort of like um, uh, yeah, tabulated form. It also contains like some statistical information for Chime 2. So this is really like a nice way to plug in now to multivariate statistics. But um, for now, and most importantly for us, it contains the GraphML network file. And this is here in the GMPS molecular network GraphML button. And there is here this one file. And the nice thing about this that you can just track and drop this into Cytoscape. So I wrote in my email yesterday that uh, in order to do all the hands-on part, you would need to install Cytoscape on your computer. Uh, who of you installed Cytoscape before and is ready to uh, do the exercise? Okay, cool. I see some people got it. Awesome. Um, yeah, in case you do not have it installed, you can you can start it now, but it's just going to take a couple of minutes. Um, so yeah, um, but it's a good investment for later on. So not only for molecular networks, but for all sorts of network visualizations. I'm a big fan of Cytoscape. I, I highly recommend um, to, to use it. Anyway, so now, yeah, what you basically need to do is you need to open Cytoscape. And I have it already open, so I'm just going to start this from scratch for you okay so close and then open so i, I start up cytoscape again and then i really just need to track and drop this graph ml file into cytoscape very convenient very simple uh, for now you could also construct it out of the table files that are in there but i think for like first time users uh, I would recommend to use this GraphML file. And then, yeah, it's really just drag and drop this here in this, in this plank field on the left. And then it should import um, all the, um, yeah, like um, information that you need for, for, the, for the molecular network. Okay. All right. So now I have my molecular network here. And you can see already in comparison to like the um, online visualization, this here is really nice because I now have like all the networks in, in one space, right? And, and this is really cool just to get like a better idea of like the global view of like the chemical space we covered. So yeah, I think this is really convenient. And now it's also really convenient because I have like way more different styling options in order to highlight notes um, uh, that are of interest for me. And yeah, I just want to show you very briefly um, how to use this a little bit. I think we may going to do a more advanced Cytoscape session um, later on at some point. But yeah, for today, I just want to showcase you how to highlight the difference between MSMS connectivity and ion identity molecular networking in here. And yeah, therefore, we're going to go here on the left to the style tab. 
Um, and then you see basically here different styling options. So I could choose different colors um, and stuff. But the important thing is that I can like um, choose some of those colors conditionally for certain properties of the nodes or the edges. And yeah, for ion identity molecular networking, I want to like work with the edges now. So I'll go here on the bottom to like this edge field instead of the node field. And then I'm going to simply uh, now change the stroke color for um, things that have different edge types. Therefore, I would yeah just like click on this and then here select edge type as a column and then have a discrete mapper. And now you see that there is cosine and MS1 annotation as two different categories. So now if let's say cosine, so this would be MS MS, I gonna have gray and then MS annotation, I gonna have black. Then you see already nicely in the network that there's two types of edges, right? And now if we zoom in a little bit, then we would see, okay, some of those are like connected uh, by like a plaque uh, edge and some of them are connected by a gray. Some of them are also connected by both. So this would be great right here. In either case, we would have like um, connected the two, the two different um, ion species. But yeah, most often it's actually truly orthogonal. So here we create connectivity um, where we did not have any before. So now the next question of course is, uh, okay, what could this be? So here, um, I like to change the labels now. So right now we simply have the, the scan number of them as a default label. But if I go back here to note, tap on the style, I can change here the label to instead of name, for example, to uh, precursor mass. And then I would have now all the masses from like my um, molecular, uh, for my different features. Okay. And now another thing I might be interested, okay, which of those features are actually annotated? So what if I would change the shape of the nodes to, I don't know, like boxes for unknown features and diamonds because they're more valuable to me right now uh, for the annotated ones. So here I can use the shape as a mapping option and then, yeah, select, I don't know, for example, uh, library class or something that indicates um, that they are annotated. Let's try this. Library class with again a discrete mapper and now both everything that has a library class I would make a diamond. And then let's see how this looks. Oh, I eventually also going to lock node width and height so it's nice and square and yeah you see already okay some of those molecules here actually have um, a diamond shape now so they are um, uh, annotated by our spectral library matching so if i click on one of them here for example the one with the mass 838 i would see now here on the table in the table on the bottom if i scroll to um, the right that this is a MS contaminant sodium formate cluster. Okay, great. So this is probably not the most interesting molecule in here, but at least I know, okay, if that is like a, I don't know, a significant feature later, well, maybe I, I need to be careful with it. But now, yeah, we can like go around a little bit in the network and look for like some examples. I don't know, this one here. Oh, this is aerobactin. And this is very interesting because I may have heard that this is a siderophore and maybe like uh, metal uptake was important for this particular data set. And yeah, like I see now, okay, there's actually um, a couple of like different derivatives um, around it, right? Or I have also seen already before, right, that there's Yersinia bactin. So we could like take a look for Yersinia bactin now and, and see how this is organized in the network. And therefore, I want to show you another handful, a uh, useful or handy uh, function in Cytoscape. And this is the search um, or filter function here. So under the style option, we can go to filter and then add here a filter, column filter, and then choose um, here a compound name as a category. And then just type in Yersinia 
And then you see already as I type this, it get filtered in the table here on the bottom, right? And I see now all like the different Yersinia backends we identified. This is actually interesting. So now if I select nodes from selected rows and I only have one, and there is this uh, binocular button here at the top or like a magnifying glass button at the top with a check mark in it. You see it? Um, if I click on this, it brings me directly like to this particular node I selected. And then, yeah, like very nicely. So we see that there is quite a family of Yersinia backdens. And interestingly, there's not only one, but two. And yeah, this is now where we eventually could use of, make use of the dashboard really quick, because I think this is a perfect example to me that highlights the power of feature-based molecular networking, because I know that in classical molecular networking, I only get typically um, one uh, node for Yersinia back then. But what if there are actually two um, dire stereomeres? Okay, and if I wanna like inspect this really quick, I'm just gonna go back to um, my feature-based molecular network in the browser. Okay, and now I'm gonna spoil a little bit already, but I think this is exciting. Um, and I'm gonna show you a fourth function that is, that is useful. And this is the uh, file summaries. So if you click here on the file summaries, and then you get basically like here a list of all the raw data because we selected them in that folder before. And now you can use here this link um, uh, to the LCMS dashboard. And now, yeah, I just gonna well, click on like the, I don't know, here second one or so, go right in. And then the cool thing is that this brings me now directly to the raw data in the web browser. So I don't need to download any files or open any software, but I, I can inspect the XIC right in the web browser. And yet now all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the mass here from Yersinia back then in my molecular network. Eventually I can even copy this out here out of that list. Let's see, yeah, if I click in here, I can copy this and now I just gonna quickly provide us here in the XIC options in the dashboard. Uh, I'll set the tolerance to 10 ppm while through five and then select here ppm. And then what this should do is it should now display exactly an extracted ion chromatogram of this mass, you know, um, uh, here in, in this field. And then you can see very, very nicely that we have two beautifully resolved uh, peaks for Yersinia back then in the mass. And when we look at the MSMS MS spectrum by clicking on the red um, axis here, so this was when like the MSMS MS was triggered, we will also see nicely that they are like perfectly um, overlapping. So this is because Yersinia back then forms diastereomeres. And yeah, like we know this already, so this is a nice example, but in case uh, I didn't know, you know, now I had like, learn something and my tool actually like considers um, those different stereoisomers. So yeah, I think with that, we're like getting close to the end of, of today's session. So um, yeah, to just wrap it up maybe, um, I hope that, uh, well, you're excited now about um, feature-based molecular networking and, and following like this tutorial, you, you um, are able now to generate a feature-based molecular network um, in, in GMPS, like starting from, um, yeah, uh, MZMine as a, as a feature finding tool. And then yeah, like explore your data a little bit here, both in the web browser as well as by downloading the data and, and visualizing it in, in Cytoscape. Um, yeah, I hope this was useful. So next time uh, we're gonna do the next step of data analysis there. So we're gonna use the same data set that uh, Robin generated, but now gonna proceed with um, in silico annotation using Sirius. So yeah, fortunately Kai Dürkop from, from the Birka lab in Jena agreed to give the lecture um, in two weeks on, on yeah, um, uh, in silico uh, annotation of MSMS spectra with Sirius, where I think he's gonna highlight molecular formula um, prediction there, as well as like um, spectrum uh, structure matching with uh, um, CMFI uh, finger ID. 
and uh, also cannabis for um, yeah, like uh, some class level uh, prediction. So yeah, with this, I think uh, in a minute, we're gonna continue with the question and answer um, session, but to those of you who are gonna leave, uh, um, yeah, thanks for, for stopping by and uh, yeah, hope to see you next time.